Well, Super Bowl was this past Sunday. It was. And what a boring one it was. (laughs) Well, you are like one of our sports fans in the office. What I loved is is that when we brought in uh, the new class of attorneys, that we got some sports fans, you know, <laughs> and I'm I'm a sports fan. I'm not uh, as obsessive as uh, people in my family, but you know I love sports, you know, and I love the fact that you love sports. <laughs> um, you're really into football too, right? I mean, I'm into it in that I have to watch it every weekend with my boyfriend. So you you pick things up, and I grew up playing sports, so I can't help but get that competitive spirit in. But I think I'm more baseball than football. But okay. I know football. My brother played growing up, and I was I was dragged to those games, so I have a pretty good understanding of the rules. I like the fact that you uh, enjoy baseball because, and there's many millennials in our office that like baseball, which is surprising because uh, people think a lot that the baseball sport is you know the old person's sport that's that you know it used to be America's pastime, but the younger generation doesn't get it. Uh, you know, they think it's boring, and yet here you, you are. You oh, like baseball. I love it. I, you know, before the pandemic, my favorite thing to do would be watching a Dodger game in a bar, being there, you know, all day with everyone. Yeah. It's so fun. Yeah. Well, I can't wait uh, for this thing to be done so we can go back to the stadium as a group and have some yeah. fun like that. Oh, the first game at Dodger Stadium, that will be, that'll be something else. Yeah, yeah. Now, y- you went to USC. Were you a uh, football fan while you were attending there? I mean, you so, went there like, what, seven years? Yeah. So I was dragged to – so I keep saying I was dragged to so many games, but it's true because my dad went to USC as well. And so we – my brother and I were raised as fans. Um, and so we were there many weekends. So by the time I got to college, I was much more interested in the social aspects of it. Um and I went to very few games. Okay. I mean, I think I got them all out of the way. But I watched all of them. Uh, but I just didn't need to be in the sun Yeah. All day. You watched them on TV. Yeah. It's, okay. You get a better view as well, I think. Yeah. Well, I, it's, I hope that Southern California or even the Pac-12 could rise again. You know, it's been so long since they were dominant. Uh, you know, the Ducks played for a couple of years that were really – it was a really good team. Of course, SC has got a long history of uh, having championships or people that are contending for mm-hmm. championships, but it seems like the SEC is so dominant now that I hate it. I know. You know? we got to back the pack. Yeah. <laughs> um, with regard to the, the Super Bowl, um, who would you who'd you watch it with? Um, I watched it. We usually have a big party, and I get very excited. I make lots of themed food. And this year it was just my boyfriend and I, his roommate, and his girlfriend, sort of a mini the mini pod we've been doing things with um and we got some ribs and so it was very special in that we got to finally be social it sounds like that was a pretty good time i yeah. mean you had food and you had company um i'm used to going to my one of my best friend's house i don't know if you know, know steve e. do you mm-hmm. know him I've heard, yeah so you know he's uh you know an employment attorney and he brings in uh all of his clients man from throughout the country uh, he actually flies them in puts them up in hotels and uh, caters to us for a whole weekend. So we not only have the Super Bowl game, but we have a Super Bowl weekend. And it really is like a mini vacation. And it's so much fun. And he he's the most energetic person that, you know, I can only do about 80% of the events. You know, but, <laughs> and he does poker, you know, uh, after we've, go, you know, dr- dragged through the city and seeing all these great things and stuff, then he has poker that starts at like 10 or 11 at night. And it goes all the way to five. And I don't know how he does it, but I did miss that this year. Actually, I think you were telling me about that last year, um, and it sounded really fun. Oh, my God. I, you have to see pictures of it. I mean, it's just wild. You know, he has this house that's a sports bar, and his wife is an angel, you know, <laughs> and, and he's got these big sons, man, that play football for college and stuff, and they're just these really, really nice people and stuff. But it's, uh, it, you know, you just can't replace that by me and Maria watching it on TV. No, it's <laughs> just not the same. <laughs> so uh, today we're going to talk about a – very important decision, mm-hmm. and, it, and it has to deal with who is responsible for paying student loans after a divorce. I mean, a husband and wife, uh, you know, are married. Somebody goes to school, or somebody has student loans that uh, are incurred during the marriage. Who has to pay for that? You know, is it is it a community debt? Uh, is it you know the person who went to school? You know, so that's what the the real issue is, and uh, I think that this is something that's rarely spoken about. 
But uh, we're going to talk about a case that really enlightens us on this, right? Definitely. What's the name of the case? Oh, yeah, I knew you were going to throw it to me. So <laughs> it's um, in remarriage of, and I did write this down phonetically, Mullen Call and Cody Yom Plonk. Gil, I believe. Ah, yeah. I, I Googled it and I did not get any responses. So this is my best attempt and I apologize to anyone that I'm That's I okay. That's, way, it that's way better than what I could do. So uh, why don't you set it up for us? What are the facts? Okay. So we have obviously a married couple. Um, they were only married for about three years. Uh, before they were married, um, she, the wife, went to medical school um, and she either graduated right before they got married or right after they got married. I No, I'm sorry. It was before they got married. Um, he was living in India, which is where they met. Um, so she was living in Michigan, and she started her medical career. She then... Let's stop right there. So they're, they meet in India. Mm -hmm. They get married, but they don't live together. No. He remains in India. He's he not remains, here in the United States. Yes. And he's living with... Or she's living with her parents. Okay, in the state Michigan. of Michigan. Okay, and then I think it was only I think it was 2014 that he came to California, um, and they were married in 2011. So it was a you know they were long distance for a while. By the time she moved to California um, in May 2013, excuse me, she, he came and joined her. She was um, still working and making about two hundred thousand dollars a year in Michigan. She was making about two hundred and twenty five thousand dollars a year. Um, she paid for his immigrate some immigration fees, which weren't very much um, once he moved here, and she essentially took care of all of the expenses. During that time, she was also paying off her student loans. Um, some of them were with financial institutions, and some of them were just her parents. Um, and actually, I think her brother a little bit too. Okay, well, let, let's slow it down a little bit. You're zipping through this thing. Uh, I love these facts. So I want to kind of massage them a little bit. All right. Before she comes to California, I believe she, uh, she starts paying off the loans. Mm -hmm. uh, meanwhile, hubby is still in India. They're not living together, but they're married. Mm -hmm. So her income during the, this marriage is considered community property, yes. right? So she's using community funds to pay back her student loans, which she eventually pays them all off, right? To yes. the tune of how much? So... Um her institutional loans, I think, came out to $153,000, um, but she paid about 23000 of those dollars before marriage. So the community um, gave $130,000. She paid, the, com the community paid back the student loans, mm -hmm. 133000 So this is one of those cases where uh, somebody's using community funds to pay off uh, some student loans. Right. She's living with her parents, so she could do that. I mean, mm -hmm. she's probably not paying very much rent or anything, and she's earning a good salary, and she's paying this. Does she pay anything else off? She's, And then she does pay off the loans to her parents um, in lump sums. Um, one was almost $50,000, and one was $60,000, and that $60,000 was paid um, two days before she met with um, an attorney, which okay. I thought was a little interesting fact. Um, another interesting fact that they don't get into too much is – that while the husband was in India, he was working, and so that money would be community as well. But there's very little discussion of of that. How much he earned, where the money is. Mm -hmm. and they also said he had assets in right. India. They don't focus too much on that. Okay. So, and I, maybe we could talk about why. Okay. <laughs> so so from what I understand is, is that uh, she pays back more than $100,000 to her parents for personal loans with mm -hmm. community money mm -hmm. and then she gets maybe a better position and she moves to California and hubby then flies to America and takes residence with her in California mm -hmm. correct mm -hmm. okay now during that marriage uh, what kind of work are they doing so she's working in the medical field uh, I'm not specific I don't specifically know what she's doing but he's not working at all She's still working within her profession, mm -hmm. making decent money, mm -hmm. and he's not working at all. No. Okay. And I think um, he's also not raising a child at that point. Um, they do have a child at some point towards the end of the marriage, uh, but for the majority of time, uh, you know, he's not being the single parent or anything. You're not calling this guy a couch hubby, are you? No, I just okay. think it's interesting. I, I noticed a little bit of an attitude there. No, I think some. I think when you think that someone's not working, you think, well, they must be raising the child. 
there's no child here. So I, I, I did wonder what he was doing. I thought so. You were kind of going, uh, was he watching TV? What was this guy doing while she's working? Right? I know. So that probably tells you a little bit about how I feel about this case. <laughs> okay. A little bit. <laughs> okay. Well, let's go on then. Okay. So, so they have a child? They have a child um, towards the end of the marriage. Okay. So it, and at some point, they, they, the marriage doesn't last. That's they have irreconcilable differences. <laughs> and who files for divorce? I think she does. Okay. Actually, she does. Okay. So she files for divorce and uh, they try to settle the case. And there's an issue that comes up in the mm-hmm. case. And what is it? So the court. The, well, what's, what's the issue? The trial court. The issue is whether or not the community needs to be reimbursed for um, expenses made towards paying off one of the party's student loans. Okay. And so uh, she's not making that an issue. He's making it an issue. Or his attorney. Yes. Yeah. So good attorney. And the attorney is saying, wait a minute, um, you know, during the time that you were, and they weren't married that long, right? I think about three years. Okay. During that time, you paid off these student loans and I'm invoking this the code, right? Do you have the code number there? I do. Section 2641. Right. 2641 is the provision that we're going to be talking about in this decision. And that code says what? It says the community shall be reimbursed for community contributions to education, including educational education loan repayments. Um, but then it goes on to say that um, there can be reduction or modification of reimbursements to the extent circumstances render such a disposition unjust. And then it goes in further about what some of those ex- exceptions um, are. And it includes where the community has substantially benefited from the education where the education of one party is offset by the education of the other party for which the community also contributed, and um, where the party's education substantially reduces that party's need for support payments. Okay. So some important facts. Also, isn't there like a 10-year rule here? Mm -hmm. What is that that rule? So that goes to that first point um, where the community has substantially benefited from the education. There's a presumption that if the loans were paid off 10 years ago, that the community substantially benefited from it. And then the reverse is true. But with presumptions, you can overcome those. Okay. So we've got this 10-year presumption that if the loans were paid off before uh, 10 years of the marriage, then uh, then it's, the burden is really going to be on the person that wants reimbursement. But Correct. here it looks like the burden is on the uh, other person because it's mm-hmm. within 10 years. So wife had the burden of proof here to show those things again. Could you state uh, the, the first one again? Um, where the community has substantially benefited from the education. Okay, and wasn't that kind of the... That's the, the main point that okay. they were using. So so he goes into court and he says the community benefited. I mean, they can't settle the case, so this is in front of a, ju- a trial judge mm-hmm. now. All right, what was mom's argument? I think her argument was that um, she was paying all the other expenses. Um, he also knew that she was p- paying back these loans, although it, it's a little unclear how much they, he actually they had like an They had an oral agreement mm-hmm. that that uh, he wouldn't have to be reimbursed for his half of the community. Also, I think that there was um, some discussion about, well, I paid for his immigration fees. Right. And I uh, and I took him on a few vacations. Okay. Where did they go on vacation? Like they went to Hawaii and India. Yeah. Um, but even the when they went to Hawaii, it was um, for a work conference. So part of it was paid for by her employer. Oh, I didn't read that part of yeah, it. Yeah. Okay. Which I thought was interesting. Um, and then part of that oral agreement that I thought was interesting was – they had a, an understanding that they were going to try to lead a debt-free life, which I think she was trying to argue meant it was okay for her to make these large payments to her parents and that he was basically aware of them because they are going to be living this debt-free life. So he benefited from it because she was frugal and paid off her debt so that they could live this. So he was lucky that she paid off this stuff, right? And that's not the argument I am <laughs> making. No, I wouldn't go that far. Um I do think it's a little interesting that she tries to use that argument to say, so of course I could give my parents $60,000 without running it by him. Um, I don't care what position you are in your marriage. I don't think anyone she, would be She loved happy. her family. She did love her family. She and took them on a lot of vacations we'll talk, talk as well. Talk a little bit about that. So um, she took him on some vacations, but she took her family on a lot of vacations. And she also would, even for the trips that she would take with her husband, it seemed like her family was coming along as well. Um, all being footed by the community. Okay. And so they went on uh, trips to Hawaii, right? Hawaii, India, Las Vegas, cruises. Um, and she sent her brother on a couple of trips. Mm-hmm. She says, here you go. Here's some checks. So you go on some you trips go. and stuff. Mm-hmm. So that's a tight-knit family. Definitely. Not, not a question. Um, so she's arguing also that 
he didn't really contribute either. That was mm-hmm. part of her argument, right? And that, yes, yeah, she was paying for all the day-to-day expenses. So, you know, it's not fair to have to reimburse him under these circumstances, basically, mm-hmm. right? So how did the trial court, court rule? So the trial court ruled in favor of wife, um, saying that the community did not need to be reimbursed. Okay. And emphasized, I believe, that this judge particularly emphasized what? That she had been paying for everything. The community had been paying for everything. And he hadn't been working. Yeah. Right? I mean, it was like, you know, uh, I just don't think it would be fair, uh, the application of this code would be fair under these circumstances where he does nothing, basically. I mean, that's kind of what he said, right? Definitely. Um, And I think on its face that argument makes some sense um, until you realize the lifestyle they were leading, um, which is something that the Court of of Appeals uh, brought up because they were... She was paying for a very, very modest lifestyle given the amount of money she was making. So I think it was something like the apartment they were living in was $1,300. Oh, my gosh. Which isn't cheap for, you know, the everyday person. But if you're making two hundred and twenty-five, dollars uh, $100,000, that's... That's a piece of cake. Yeah. Yeah. It's easy to make. Um, so I think if you look at the nuances of this case, it makes more sense why they reversed um, the trial court's just oh, you, you just like spoiler. you just ruined it for spoiler alert. She's already spoiled it. Okay, it goes up on appeal. Oh, yeah. See, I want to be dramatic, and you want to get right to it. Okay, I know it's so, that that law school train. I just want to get okay. my turn done. And <laughs> that's okay. I'm not a law professor, and you won't be absent for the day. So, for uh, so anyway, I don't know if you had that in law school, but I went, when, in the law school I went to, if you did not brief the case. Um, and they called on you, and you had nothing to say, they'd say, I'm deeming you absent for the day. And if you had three absents, you were out of the school. We had some of the – out of the school? Well, out of the class, I think, is what what it was. But, I mean – They were sticklers. Yeah, and it really was like that, you know. I got called on something once. Um, You know, they they also said that you couldn't bring in uh, supplemental stuff. You know, and there's all these, like, little booklets that you could buy and these cheap things. So I read this case. It It was a property case. But I also wanted to make sure that I understood it. So I got this little thing. And before the professor started lecturing, I was kind of like looking it over. And he spotted that. And he calls on me. He says, uh, Mr. Schweitzer, why don't you recite the facts of this case? <laughs> and uh, I started reciting them. And he goes, yeah, but you got that thing over there, right there. And so he started like really probing to see if I really knew the case. And the way that I got out of it, he said, uh, and it had to deal with the, in the death of one of the guys. I said, he said, what do you think was with him? Why did he do that? I said, well, I think that he was circling. He knew he was circling the drain, you know, and he just started laughing and everything, you know, and he realized they had read it and he gave mm-hmm. me a pass. But, uh, yeah, this isn't that, okay? okay. So <laughs> Long you could, story. You could slow down. You could, you could build into my dramatic uh, effort here. So can I hear some music, please? It, it goes up on appeal, oh, okay? That's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Suspense, right? And so what did the Court of Appeals say? The Court of Appeals um, reversed the trial court's decision and did rule that... Actually, this was something I meant to look up before because uh, they they found fault with the way the trial court decided, but they didn't actually make a ruling that the community um, was entitled to reimbursement. They said that the trial court had used the wrong standard. Um so I've, I've meant to look up what has happened to this case. I'm sure it's been in litigation for a long time, so it's probably sort of moot at this point. But I did have that well, was question. It, was it remanded? It just said it's reversed. Yeah, so, so. If, if it's reversed, that means that it's saying, no, uh, she's got to reimburse. But it had to have been remanded somewhat, right? Oh, you know what? The matter is remanded with directions to order wife to reimburse the community for community funds spent. Okay. Yeah. So, sorry yeah. for that detour. I, it had been on my mind, and if I had just read the conclusion more yeah. carefully. Yeah. But they did find a lot of fault with the way that the trial court went about its decision. Um, so I do wonder if the trial court had maybe maybe come to the same decision but used some different um, logic. I wonder if they would have reversed it. Oh, possibly. Or remanded, yeah. Well, let's talk about what some of the faults that the Court of Appeal found. So the biggest one, and I think it's really interesting, is um, this. it begins with this idea of community property that money made during the marriage is the community's, regardless of who makes it. And that's a very basic tenet of property in, or community, or property in California. Um, the Court of Appeals found that the trial court was basically saying that the non-working party, the husband in this case, had to earn his right to this reimbursement or to the community. And so they're using that argument that 
you were, you know, cheekily using as well. Like, he wasn't doing anything, so he really didn't earn a right to it. And so, that's, so you're telling me that a spouse could be a couch potato, indeed. not work, not even a penny, because in this case he didn't earn a penny, but he's still entitled to reimbursement yes. pursuant to this code, right? Yes. And is, that, is that what the Court of Appeal said? Basically, yes. Yeah. And that's what it says that the code says, right? Right. Because the code specifically says that, I believe, that you know the court can't deny it based on, on that purpose. What else? Um, so that's the biggest one. Um, and then they also, they found that, I don't know if this will be as interesting to our viewers and listeners, but um, the standard of the review, they said, fell in the middle of de novo and abuse of discretion, which you don't always see. Um, so I thought that was... And well, how is that important? Um, so if it's reviewed on de novo, that means the Court of Appeals just gets to look at the case fresh eyes, not really even look at what the trial court did. Look at the facts, right? Yeah. And, and kind of weigh the facts themselves, they right? Get, yeah, they're making the decision from, you know, point zero, I guess, you know, just from yeah. the beginning. Yeah. Um, abuse of discretion is a higher standard, and it's much more difficult if the Court of Appeals has to use that standard to reverse a decision. Um, they have to find that the trial court, as the name suggests, abused its discretion, and basically no logical person would, or logical court would have ruled this way. Um, so finding that the standard review in the standard of review is in the middle, it, it's in, interesting and also frustrating because it's going to be difficult to, um, you know, use this case or get a bright line rule, which we all obviously want and the way, rarely. The way get. that I looked at it is, it was a factual analysis, and it's kind of held to its own facts. Mm-hmm. I mean, you'd have to, if you're going to cite this case fact for factual purposes, you have to find something that's quote unquote on point, right? right? I mean, or close to it. And in this case, what you have is, uh, a, you know, an upper middle class income. You have a short term marriage, somebody paying off a fairly large amount of, of loans during the marriage that were separate property mm-hmm. loans. You know, that's kind of the case that you'd have to have in order to right. really rely on this decision. Right. But, but what the appellate court did is, is it looked at these facts and it said, oh, no, you know, I mean, the community did not benefit and that's going back to that first point, I think, is is that they the trial court is supposed to see whether or not the community really benefited mm-hmm. from this income or was that income defrayed because you were paying off these loans. And mm-hmm. in this case, that's what the Court of Appeals said, right? Yeah, and they were looking a lot at the standard of living that the husband, or I guess both of them, were enjoying during this time. You know, she's getting this huge benefit of paying off, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. And the benefit towards the community is, you know, the $1,300 apartment. What about the uh, argument that she said, hey, you know what, you you shouldn't apply this code because he and I had an agreement. You know, it's wrong. It's completely unfair for you to uh, hold me to this when we had a prior agreement that he would not want to be reimbursed for this. So the statute is pretty clear, um, and I know they talk about it at the end, that um, you need it to be expressed and written. And, you know, there's just no getting around that. You, you know, having an oral agreement is not a written agreement. And you, I don't care how good your facts are, you're not going to win that argument. Okay. All right. Well, um, any lessons that you learned from this? Well, I actually have a question for you. Okay. Um, you know, we were talking about how this is pretty fact specific. Do you think the court would have ruled differently if she had been paying off less of her student loans and they were enjoying a higher standard of living? Well, it depends, obviously, obviously, you know, but yeah, I think that that could be the case. I think so too. You know, I mean, he did enjoy, he in that case, he would enjoy the benefits of her education and right. he could make a more uh, colorful argument and the uh, Court of Appeal probably would defer to the trial court more at yeah. that point, right? I think so. Yeah. And then you could, you know, she paid off, you know, a fourth of it and he's living in, I don't know, the $5,000 <laughs> apartment. I think you could make a, an argument that the community definitely benefited from her education. Yeah. So this is really applicable to a lot of uh, people out there now that have massive student loans. Mm-hmm. You know, um, unfortunately, we're in this time period where people go to college and uh, the student loans dwarf what people in my generation had. When I left right. uh, college, I had uh, a whopping seventy five hundred dollars, and uh, how are you going to get out of that? <laughs> and I think I got some assistance on that from the police department. Uh, you know, so it wasn't a big deal. My law school was, you know, it wasn't cheap for the time, but I still was able to pay it mm-hmm. off. Nowadays, people are coming into these marriages 
two hundred thousand dollars debt. I mean, it's it's really a scary thing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what happens if they're paying off that student loan debt and they never really live according to their income? And at the end of a marriage, there's this massive amount of reimbursement. Just going to be in more debt at that point. It seems maybe, maybe premarital agreements uh, make more sense. I think so, and I think as we talked about, you know, those oral agreements don't mean anything in this context. So, you know, I think there's a stigma around prenuptial agreements sometimes. There shouldn't be, I don't think, yeah. because the way the law is written, they're necessary a lot of times. Yeah, I'm not, uh, you know, I, when I bring in clients that either want a premarital agreement or the other side does, you know, I do what I'm supposed to do. Mm -hmm. I, I read to them or, you know, what their rights are. I let them know that what they're waiving. I'll advocate strongly for them if they don't like what's proposed or what the other side is saying. But ultimately, you know, I'm kind of a middle of the road type of person. Uh, I do think that premarital agreements sometimes cause stress in a relationship because it shifts power. There's a lot. There's something to argue about that could get really ugly. Um, you know, so so you know, I see problems sometimes with premarital agreements. But in this case, if somebody's coming in with a massive amount of money like this. And they're paying it over a 10 or 20 year marriage. Well, actually, that wouldn't apply. Let's say that the marriage was nine years. You know, um, mm, you know, I, that that's a tough one. Uh, so, you know, uh, drink lots of champagne, go on vacations, give, rack up your credit card, get in more debt so you don't have to reimburse, right? Exactly. That's <laughs> what they want us to take from this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, you know, the uh, the decision is one of the very few decisions that you're, you're going to see regarding student loans. Oh, I am aware. I was doing some research on student loans, and there is not a lot of information out there. Yeah, yeah. or just this this code. I mean, you know, they don't cite to a lot of cases here. You know, and they even say that there's a dearth of decisions yeah. on this issue. But this might be one of the issues that we're going to see often and people that come to us are going to have. So I think so. I, I appreciate your, your scholarly uh, efforts to you know, educate people on this. And, uh, you know, I can't wait to see you speak at the next time. We're <laughs> going to have another case for you sometime soon. So. Very excited. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>